Well, welcome everybody. Um, we uh, on the Klein Commission are going to have a, a simple meeting and a long public hearing about uh, of some topics that I'm sure is very dear to our community and to our uh, city administration and uh, electeds. So the um, Planning Commission is required to have hearings on the amendments to comprehensive plan and revised code for the zoning ordinance. So what I'm going to do now is introduce our two Spanish speaking interpreters and that's Marcella and Elena. So Marcella and Elena, would you please take it away? So uh, Marcella and Ileana are here and they're going to give an introduction in Spanish and then also an introduction in English so that the uh, English speakers also know what is being said, so I will turn it over to them. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Marcela Rey y mi compañera es Eliana Rey. Estamos aquí para interpretarle a las personas que hablan español. No vamos a interpretar la reunión entera, pero cuando comience la parte de la audiencia, de de la audiencia pública va a haber oportunidad para hacer comentarios al público y estaremos aquí. Si desean participar, pueden presionar en la parte de abajo de la pantalla. Está el icono de levantar la mano. Pueden presionarlo y decir que necesitan asistencia de una intérprete, estamos pendientes y conectaremos inmediatamente y empezaremos a interpretarles. Por favor, recuerden que tienen que hacer pausas para poder interpretar de manera consecutiva. Ustedes hablan, pausan y luego nosotras continuamos interpretando. También, uh, como no se va a interpretar toda la reunión, si en algún otro momento necesitan ponerse en contacto con algunos de los comisionados, de los planificadores, pueden a través de la señora Anderson ponerse en contacto con con el personal y tratarán entonces de encaminar para buscarles una respuesta. Good evening, my name is Marcela Rey and my colleague here is Eliana Rey. We are here today to interpret for Spanish speakers. We will not be interpreting the entire meeting, but when public comments begin during the public hearing, you will have the opportunity. If you want to participate, please raise your hand, the button on the bottom of the screen, usually on the reactions. And when your name is called, request assistance, and then we will begin interpreting your comments. Please pause. We're gonna be interpreting the consecutive mode, which means that you will need to pause for us to render our interpretation. Interpretation. Also, if you need to get in touch with someone, please get in touch with the staff through Ms. Anderson, and they will try to facilitate and to see that you can get an answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcella. So our first order of business is public comments. This is an opportunity for the public to make comments uh, on behalf of themselves for um, the Planning Commission. This is for three minute limitation and it is not for comments related to the public hearing content. Those comments and testimony are appropriate during the public hearing uh, portion of our meeting. So this is only for those issues that you wish to bring to us that are not related to the uh, public hearing. So uh, Rita, do we have anyone with raised hands? Yes, we do. I currently see, oh, it went down to two raised hands. I see Marilyn K. It looks like um, <laughs> Marilyn K. One moment, please. Okay. And Elizabeth Mooney. So we will go with Marilyn first and then Elizabeth. I'm promoting Marilyn to panelist. One moment. Marilyn, you can go ahead and unmute. I'm trying. Okay. Hello. Marilyn, welcome to the Planning Commission. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I realized I cannot tell you exactly where in the document I, I'm talking about, but this is about the toll pipeline 
proposed toll pipeline right of way um, that's proposed to go across Swamp Creek, Swamp Creek wetlands between 73rd and 80th Avenue Northeast. Um, and I'm here today asking that the proposed toll pipeline trail be removed from the comprehensive plan uh, in its review. Uh, the identification of this trail by the Parks and Recreation Capital Facilities element should also be deleted and the pedestrian facilities plan for the following reasons. First, there are very, there's several practical matters uh, as far as cost of what this would run to build. It only runs from 73rd to 80th. It does not have a destination. Uh, it, it's, it only ends at 80th Avenue Northeast. The trail does not continue. Um, so I, I'm feeling like the, the expense of this is, is crazy. It's six to eight million dollars was quoted in the meeting of the city council. Uh, it requires multiple jurisdiction permits to cross a large wetland. It's a 92 acre wetland. It has two streams, Swamp Creek and Little Swamp Creek. Uh, then there is the cost of maintenance of the floating or pile driven trail as the wetlands flood and migrate maintaining garbage facility collection facilities would be required. Um, the, on the environmental concerns, this is a major water retention resource that should be allowed to do that job within, without interference from us. We may have salmon, Swamp Creek was salmon bearing at one time, but with attempted improvements or outright filling, I do not know if we have any currently. We for sure have smaller fish, shrimp, bugs of all kinds, amphibians, that feed the salmon and the critters that call this place home. I have been part of a water quality testing program through Snow King Watershed Council, and I participate in a wildlife camera study affiliated with the University of Washington. From our testing of the water, we have found pretty good water quality in this lower reach, which, which would be affected by humans and their pets and their bicycles and what they would leave behind. All of this affects the Sammamish River and Lake Washington and eventually the whales of Puget Sound. This is a major wildlife corridor for animals that have been using it for years to more recently displaced animals as their forests and smaller wetlands have been consumed by growth. The Karen, Kenmore Heron Rookery is housed here. If they are too disrupted, the history shows that Heron will move on, which would be a huge loss to Kenmore. I have a picture showing five herons feeding in the exact location of this proposed trail from perhaps only a month ago. Marilyn, that's. Yes. That's your time. OK, I did not finish, but I can certainly send you information. Thank you so much. We would very much appreciate it. And let, to let you know, we do read what we receive. All right. Should I send it to Lori Anderson? Please send it to Lori or Rita. OK. okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time. So Rita, we have one other person. It uh, looks like a couple other hands have gone up. So next okay. we have Elizabeth Mooney. So just one moment as I promote her to panelist. And then after Elizabeth, we have Peter Lance, Stacy V, and then Chris Olson. I would like to remind those who wish to testify under public comments that you if you want to testify about issues on the public hearing, that should wait to the public hearing. Please go ahead. Uh, I believe it's, um, I don't see Elizabeth. Now, now do you see me? Oh, there you are. Thank you for waving. Hi. Elizabeth, please go ahead. And, and there's the Chinook salmon right there above my head. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm here on behalf of everything that's associated with protecting the salmon in Kenmore. And um, I really appreciate that the planning commission continues, but I think we have a little bit of a, a disconnect with those in our community because of COVID and Zoom making planning commissions and council meetings really easy to make progress. I, um, I started walking around the city the other day and discovered um, that I really hadn't been paying attention doing site visits. So I think that our community is a bit behind and that the city um, needs to prioritize our zoning, sort of slow down your planning 
and your decision making and then flip flop so that your highest priority is protecting the salmon because every single thing that we do, whether it's air, water, sediment or zoning um, or laws is going to be better for the health of the citizens if you protect the wetlands, the tree canopy, the riparian zones that are in Kenmore. And sorry to say this, but Lake Forest Park started off years ago when PERC formed. It was right after Lake Forest Park Stewardship Foundation was protecting tree canopy. And we've gone from a, if you take a Google map and you look at when we incorporated in 98 and you look at what was surrounding Chet Shotville 0056 that goes down 61st or down Swamp Creek, all I'm saying is we've gone from green and gray to more gray because of impervious surfaces and variances. So what I want to do is I support what Marilyn Knudsen is talking about. Get that tra told trail out of the comprehensive plan. It's not your fault, but it's sticking in there and it keeps popping up just like artificial turf it's at on a wetland at St. Edward Park. We've got to get smarter in Kenmore, get back to our council members to set policy that puts our zoning maps around the maps that prioritize first the streams, the wetlands, and the buffers, and then say no when every, every developer comes in and asks for a variance. So, um, and I've chatted with some of you council members, you know who you are, and I know that one of the folks that I worked with on the Shoreline Master Plan, um, um, Jim, Jim Howard, <laughs> Um, he, he pointed out that we don't have enough going on about tree canopy, but anyway, let's all take a site visit together and then you'll see what happens if we don't put our zoning maps around the, the streams. Ms. Sorry, Mooney, that's, thank that's you. That's me trying to save the, the street. There's another thing going on. I'll tell you Elizabeth, about it. Elizabeth, that's it. Sorry, I'll mute me. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Appreciate I'll see, your time. I'll see you at the hearing. I'll see you at the hearing. Okay, so Rita, who's our next uh, guest? Next, we have Peter Lance. And give me just one moment as I promote him to panelist. Peter, go ahead. No, unmute all. Yeah, we're ready for you, Peter. Okay, can you see me now? Can you hear me? We can see you and we can hear you. Excellent, excellent. I'll try to be brief and I hope I'm speaking at the right venue here. I just had a couple of oversight comments about, I've been reading all the information here. Uh, it seems like Kenmore is trying to do a lot. It's a small town and it seems like for some of these issues, teaming up with Bothell, Briar, Lake Forest Park would be good. We have a, a housing crisis or issue, not a crisis, but uh, it's a problem and you're trying to solve it. We have only six, six square miles of real estate and this is a regional problem. Not, and also these, these towns I just mentioned are similarly situated. Uh, not only are they next to us, but they're bounded by I-5 and 405 and so, we, uh, they have other things to bear. You guys are trying to be employers. You're trying to uh, appeal to a large demographic of different incomes. And it's just very difficult to think you can be everything, an employer and a home to everybody. Uh, so I'd encourage you to reach out. The other thing I was going to talk about, and I may be out of school here, but the comprehensive plan and the uh, the plan to uh, start adding homes, uh, duplexes and triplexes in the communities feels a bit like a European, a old European approach. Uh, Peter, I, I have to say something, and I, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I need to. That topic is under the, uh, the public hearing. Okay. So I, I, and we would love to have you speak at that time, but this would not be the appropriate Is, is that later today or? It's later to this okay. very meeting. Okay, then I have one last concept to throw out at you. What would you do if Kenmore 
was a blank slate. And you start looking at it from brand new. You have a lot of old houses, a lot of old stuff. And some of it's going to rot and go away. And maybe you should think about redoing everything uh, or letting things fade away instead of compounding uh, your damages here. And I, I feel like, again, I'm wandering into your hearing here in, with that comment. But look, my last comment is everything seems to be geared towards life ends at 2050. Well, there are going to be people here in 2050. What are you leaving? What's the legacy of this, of this group for the uh, 2050 people? Where are we going to be? And uh, I'm concerned that we don't have a well thought out plan going forward. And again, I think I'm creeping into the next one and I, I'm going to be quiet now and uh, say goodbye. Thank you very much. And I didn't mean to um, squash you at all, but I hope you will stay on and, and finish your thoughts with regard to the issues with the public hearing. Okay? I will. Thank you very much. Peter. Thank you. Okay, Rita, do we have someone else for the public comments? Uh, yes, next we have Stacy V. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We cannot you. see you, but we can hear you. Oh, let me fix that. Hey, oh, there you are. <laughs> so good evening. Um, Stacy Valenzuela Kenmore. I've participated for months with the Planning Commission and saw what great work you guys did for affordable housing, tried to do for environmental protections. However, on this page that I see, um, some of the paperwork um, and attachments, it looks like the direction coming back from the staff might be in the direction of affordable housing that is only 50% and doesn't hit the 30 percentile. Also the missing middle that we're seeing. Um, Stacey, there's a lot of Stacey, I'm gonna have to say the same thing that I said to Peter. It's really it's, important that if it, you have it's, comments it's about- It's listed on the agenda though. Yeah, that's, your, and we're gonna have a, yes, and we're gonna uh, have okay. a public hearing. Okay, so that's why I wanted to mention it. And Stacy, I really would like to hear your comments and go on the record at the public hearing. Okay, well, well I have more in regards to the affordable housing. Um, also, it's for our workers that are earning 50K and below and living in tents, cars, and couch surfing, facing homelessness. Our senior veterans, disabled, have three to four year wait list for housing, and they will soon be on the street. Another problem is that we have to where the city did pass a moratorium ordinance to build 25% very low affordable housing in any um, of the um, developments that were gonna go up in the TOD area, but variances were given. Um, this is a problem, especially since we need 42,000 units just in King County by 2024. That's only a couple of years away. Your leadership is really making a difference. And I thank you for all the hard work that you guys are doing on the planning commission, but we need the staff, the city to enforce that. And that goes the same for our environmental issues, um, giving variances, encroaching on wetlands, uh, not protecting the trees and letting them be tree the whole lot cleared for development, um, cementing parks. These are increasing our greenhouse gases. It's gonna increase our heat and it's destroying our climate. And this is very important stuff. And I know that you guys work very, very hard to make a lot of these things happen. And I hope they listen to you and the public with a lot of these great changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stacy. I hope you stay <clears throat> and <clears throat> provide us some more public comments or public um, feedback at the public hearing time. Thank you. You're welcome. Rita, do we have anyone else awaiting? Uh, yes, next we have Chris Olson, and then after that, uh, John Hendrickson. Okay.
Chris, we cannot hear you or see you. All right, can you guys hear me now? Sorry, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Okay. All right. Uh, my name's Chris Olson. Um, so I guess the first question I have is I had a question about parking requirements and I wasn't sure if that would be something that's on the agenda. It looked like it was in the comprehensive plan. So I just wanted to check before I- well, You can on. go ahead and speak about parking requirements. Okay, so um, there's a few things I guess I'd like to discuss to start with. I am actually, I, I would love to see the troll, troll pipeline trail happen. Um, I don't see the trail being a significant environmental impact to the wetlands, given that it's not gonna be pollution generating surfaces. Um, I think that things that are going to impact hydrology and, and wetland um, health and that type of thing is probably gonna be more dependent on um, single vehicle or single occupancy vehicle uh, infrastructure. So parking requirements, if we have uh, excessive parking requirements and underutilized parking, then we're building a bunch of parking that isn't being used. And that when that parking is used, pollutants get on the roadway and that washes off into the water. Um, and we can treat that water, but it is expensive and it takes time and that limits what the city can do with its funds as well. Um, so I would love to see that trail happen in the future. I'm, what I am hoping for is that 80th Street gets some sort of sidewalk connection to through that neighborhood. So there's some work around to get to downtown Bothell in the future. Um, that's an alternative to the Burke Gilman Trail for residents where it's difficult to cross 522 um, as all the crossings currently are at grade. Um, and I, I guess the big thing for parking requirements is I'm hoping to see parking requirements go into place that don't just consider vehicle parking, but also considers protected uh, cyclist parking and that type of thing. So that way we can encourage people not to just drive cars. Um, I, I see that that's a priority and that's something that I've run into before is there is not a place oftentimes uh, for protected cyclist parking beyond just locking it up out front. Um, that's a kind of difficult problem to solve though. So <laughs> not, not quite sure where we'll go with that, but I just was thinking since we have vehicle parking requirements, maybe we could impose some other form of requirement in that sense. Um, I think those are the big things and I'll wait for now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. We appreciate you coming. And if you have anything else that you'd like to speak on the items that are for the public hearing, I hope and we hope <clears throat> that you would stick around and say anything you would like during that period. Thank you. Will do. You're welcome. Rita, who do we have next? Uh, next, we have John Hendrickson. Okay. John, we can see you. Can you hear me too? And we can hear you. Okay, Please guys, thanks. Right ahead. Thanks very much. Um, I appreciate the politeness that Dwight Thompson gives to everybody, but he is squashing them and he's stopping them from speaking uh, when they want to speak. I was on the council for eight years and we always, you were always free to say whatever you wanted. And um, so some people can't stay for the public hearing. Didn't even ask him about that. And uh, so I don't think that serves the public very well to cut people off like that. Um, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about when you guys passed the um, uh, accessory dwelling unit um, proposal and that process. I went through those meetings and in order to have these accessory dwelling units without having a big SEPA review and a growth management review required under the law for public safety regarding surface water management, protection of streams, public safety for roads and pedestrians, eliminating parking, having triplexes is what they, this, the council wanted and no addition, no parking provisions. It's a recipe for disaster. And they never told us, they never told the planning commission, they never, the staff never told the council that under RCW 3670A.600, sections three and four, the state legislature tied the court's hands and you couldn't have SEPA, you couldn't appeal for SEPA, you couldn't appeal for Growth Management Act, you couldn't appeal for public safety or the environment, nothing. Pedestrian safety, let them die, I guess. So, and they didn't tell the city council either. Now, if you look at the people like Debbie Bent, look at her house. 
where she lives, it's not going to affect her. Her backyard is like two and a half acres owned by King County. She has a two and a half acre wooded backyard. She's not going to be overcrowded. Look where Deborah Shrevnik lives up on three quarters of an acre overlooking the lake. This is elitist policy here. And um, this kind of misinformation and lying by omission, not informing the public or the planning commission or the council of the facts. You, why would you ever approve that? And what are you going to approve next with this kind of policy making? Please pay more attention. You need to look this up yourself. They're not gonna tell you the whole truth. Thank you. Thank you, John, appreciate your comments. If you have any other comments regarding those issues for the public hearing, we hope you would stay and make them. Rita, do we have anyone else? I see no more hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. I just for the record want to state that on our agenda and public comments, it Chair does Thompson, yes. I'm so sorry, a hand just went up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Is that, are we good to go? Yes, please okay. go ahead. Um, yeah, give me just one second. Looks like Janet Hayes. Okay. And just a reminder, if you'd love to give um, public comment right now, go ahead and please use the raised hand feature so we can get you on the list here. Okay, Janet, we cannot hear you or see you yet. Odd place. There okay. we go. We can hear Hi. you and see you. <laughs> Hi. I'm Janet Hayes, and I've been a resident of Canmore since 1998. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I think it's that you can't see me. I can see you. I think everyone else can, too. Hear me. Everyone. You're okay. You, okay, so what's happening is I think you're honestly, and Rita will uh, talk to, to you also, but I believe with your video on, your Wi Fi connection is, is struggling. So you may, if it's okay with you, turn off your video and your um, our audio would be better. I think we lost her all together. Yeah, I think I think we've lost her. Well, if she wants to come back on once you see her again. If there, oh, oh, here she there comes. She okay, Janet, go ahead. Um, I've been a resident of Kenmore for since 1998. I I'm speaking because I support John Hendrickson. I support Hendrickson that spoke. Um, I, I'm very much concerned about the environment and every, every council comment and the things that I am noticing about the planning commission and the council is most of you depend on all of your information from staff. Really, you have a, a many uh, documents that you can look up things and, and it's gonna take a lot of work to educate you uh, with all the knowledge that the people that continue to comment at council and at planning commission meetings, um, all of the information they have to give you. You you might make different choices if you were able to find out about the documents. So I've started a process that of sending the council documents of great importance and your planning commission has great importance also. There regarding our shoreline 
in Kenmore and the a, a particular spot called the birthing channel, which is where the wharf is and new parking and development is being looked at and attempted but there are many things that have to do with that birthing channel and the north end of Lake Washington that ha has proven that there are toxins in the water and at our shoreline. There are Army Corps of Engineer reports. There are um, things that you need to have and be able to understand what we're fighting for, we're fighting to save our shoreline. And the, the runoff that goes in there off of the Lake Point project, the pipes that go right into the Sammamish Slough. So I just try to Ms. urge Hayes. you to slow down. Listen to more than Debbie Bent. Ms. Hayes, and that's staff. your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. Do you have yeah. anyone else? I see no more hands at this time. Yeah, I, I would like to remind all of our guests that are with us tonight that um, if you present and provide the city council with documents, that's not the same as providing us with the same documents. If you wish us to consider such documents, I would suggest that you provide a copy to um, our staff um, directed to us, and then we can include that in our uh, consideration. But um, normally what is uh, provided to the city council is not on our record. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. All right, if that is the conclusion of our public comments, do it's time for any motions. Do we have a motion? Tracy? I uh, have make a motion to excuse Christiana Matthews, one of our planning commissioners from the meeting tonight. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, and this is due to her uh, family vacation. I believe she's watching us on YouTube from Spain or some France or some wonderful European country. Uh, if there is no objection, um, the motion will be carried and will be uh, approved by the commission. Hearing none, so approved. Uh, <clears throat> next on the um, agenda is the approval of the minutes. Are there any comments on the minutes from uh, members or uh, um, issues that they wish to amend. Hearing none, unless there's an objection, the uh, April 19th Planning Commission meeting minutes are approved uh, by unanimous consent. So our next item on the agenda is the public hearing on the comprehensive plan elements and development regulation amendments. I want to refer everyone to uh, the items that are on the uh, docket, which is uh, the 517 staff memo, attachment one through attachment eight. All of these items are open for uh, public comment with regard to a public hearing. This is an official public hearing. Um, Lori, I believe we're going to have our interpreters make a interpretation at this point. I, I think um, they might just acknowledge that we're starting the public hearing and that if someone needs assistance, uh, they should uh, let th them know when they are called forward. So Marcilla, do you want to let folks know that? And then I'll do a brief presentation. Buenas, entonces esta es la parte donde pueden comenzar a hacer, va a empezar la audiencia pública y pueden participar si es con respecto a la audiencia pública. Como indicamos anteriormente, habrá la posibilidad de interpretación. Thank you. Laurie, did you want to do an introduction then? 
I did. Thank you. Uh, so good evening. For the record, my name is Lori Anderson. I'm a planner with the city and I'm going to give a very brief overview of the Planning Commission's recommendations for uh, the comprehensive plan and a development regulation amendments. Uh, once the Planning Commission finalizes their recommendation, it would go to the City Council for their uh, review and consideration. Um, my overview, I expect, will take maybe six or seven minutes, so it will be short. Uh, more detailed information is available on the City's website uh, if you want to look at that. So I'll begin with significant changes to the vision statement. This is the 20-year vision statement. And the statement is the framework for the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. It is to describe what Kenmore will look like and be like in 2044. So the Planning Commission's preliminary recommendations uh, retain many of the current concepts in uh, the vision statement, but they add or expand uh, some of the following. First, they encourage a diversity of well-maintained housing types to provide living accommodations affordable to all residents. They see Kenmore as leading and actively participating in regional efforts to promote environmental stewardship, sustainability, restoration, and conservation, while continuing to act boldly and wisely to slow climate change and address its impacts. The amendments state that Kenmore is friendly and inclusive, welcoming all types of families, supporting diversity, and fostering a sense of belonging and pride in all residents. And they state that the city embraces its role as a high capacity transit community, supporting bus rapid transit and other transit options as part of the regional network. Proposed amendments to the vision statement support providing convenient access to goods and services essential to resident meeting residents daily needs and state that the city will make financially sustainable commitments to achieve all aspects of the vision. Turning to the land use element or the land use chapter of the plan, new goals, objectives, and policies provide for a diversity of housing types, including missing middle housing, in this case, duplexes and triplexes in some formerly low density residential neighborhoods within a quarter mile of the city's two major transit corridors. The element includes language to consider new opportunities for small scale neighborhood commercial uses within walking distance of homes, if compatibility concerns can be addressed. The changes acknowledge that the city is both a high capacity transit community because of the future uh, bus rapid transit that will be coming to State Route 522 in 2026, but also a candidate countywide growth center with related responsibilities. Uh, related to that, amendments support concentrating transit-oriented development in the area centered on the Kenmore Park and Ride on Buffalo Way with higher residential densities and affordable housing requirements. They also promote policies also promote multi-story development downtown. The Planning Commission has added language to recognize and support people of color, indigenous and immigrant populations, and other individuals or groups who have historically been underrepresented in community goal setting and implementation. The amendments support the large number of home-based businesses in Kenmore and recognize their importance. They encourage opportunities for small-scale pedestrian-oriented commercial development near trails. And the changes amend the comprehensive plan map to show the public private facilities land use designation for the proposed public works facility at 6450, 6506, and 6520 Northeast 202nd Street. Housing element, significant changes to the housing chapter. Uh, assess Kenmore's history of racially discriminatory land use and housing practices along with an analysis of displacement risk, uh, review housing affordability data related to countywide expectations, support tenant protections, as in the land use element, provide opportunities for medium density housing and some formerly low density neighborhoods close to transit. Again, we're talking duplexes and triplexes. And the Planning Commission has suggested an incremental approach to expanding future medium density opportunities. 
goals and policies support requiring affordable housing when development densities are increased. Uh, they legitimize existing legal housing types. They support alternative home ownership models and incorporate new policies about housing equity. The capital facilities element uh, reflects decisions by the city council over the last year. They review the capital improvement program every year. And uh, so they reflect changes from the capital improvement program, but they also support using surplus public property and local resources to leverage other public and private funding for the creation or preservation of affordable housing and state that the impacts and benefits of public capital facilities should be equitably dispersed throughout the community. Turning to development regulation changes, they are to rezone the properties that I mentioned on Northeast 202nd Street from R6 to public semi-public to allow consideration of a public works facility there. And the changes also include new regulations that would allow duplexes and triplexes in portions of the city's R6 residential zoning district. Those changes do a number of things, and I'm just going to touch on uh, the, the major topics. First, they provide new definitions for duplexes and triplexes. They identify the permitted locations. Uh, they focus on lot dimensions rather than lot size. So to do a stacked duplex, which is uh, one unit on top of the other, you need to have a minimum 40 foot wide by 100 foot deep lot. For a side by side duplex or a triplex, you need a 50 foot wide lot by 100 foot deep lot minimum. And then they provide a list of dimensional standards for new buildings on those lots. So the width and depth of the buildings are regulated to address compatibility issues, which is what we have heard is a major concern to the community. The regulations also limit height. The current single family uh, zoning height is 35 feet, which does allow for three stories of development. Uh, this uh, for duplexes and triplexes, uh, the regulations would cap that height at 30 feet with a 24 foot height to the eave, which would mean a two and a half story building is the maximum you could achieve. And then other standards address the way the building should face the street. It talk, they talk about where the entry should be. Um, they also set out standards about the garage, that it should be set back from the front facade. They limit the width of the driveway in the front yard uh, and talk about how wide the driveway should be if it goes down the side yard. And they give a provision to allow a garage in the, in the back of the lot to encroach into the rear yard, which is 20 feet in the current standards. Parking reflects state law, which has a 0.75 stall per unit uh, maximum within a quarter mile of transit. And lastly, uh, the tree preservation rules are not addressed with these amendments. And that means that any new duplex or triplex would have to conform to the city's multifamily tree protection regulations, which are more restrictive than those for single family residences. So with that, I'll turn it back to Chair Thompson to open the public hearing. Right, and I would also like to note that we have received email comments from Robert and Virginia Noss, uh, Dick Roberts, uh, Marcel Fadol, and Chris Brown. And those are attached to the agenda and the packet tonight. So with that being said, uh, if there's no further comment from the members of the council, I mean the commission, then, um, we will uh, proceed with the public hearing. And our, uh, if you are uh, Spanish speaking, our uh, interpreters will be glad to help and take care of this for us. So um, Rita, who's first up? First up, we have Stacy V and then Peter Lance. Okay, Stacy. Give me just one second while I promote her. It's okay. I would appreciate if you have specific comments about a specific item 
that means a specific piece in a certain attachment that you would spell out which attachment you're concerned about and what page that is on. That would help us all out to know exactly what you're talking about. If it's general comments, that's fine. Stacy, I see you there again, and it is now your turn. Please. Sorry, it's it's too late for me to go back and look at what page it's on. That's okay. I'm I'm just, just, that's, <laughs> we can find it. Okay, it's Stacy Valenzuela Kenmore. I'm speaking in regards to the comprehensive plan and also towards housing. Now my page moved to me. Uh, first. We need Kenmore as well as Puget Sound and surrounding cities comprehensive plans for 2022 to 2026 to concentrate to add 1099 the House bill protections to close the growth management board loophole and protect more pocket open spaces. We also need remediation of toxic matka sites, the sediment in our waterways that became law by citizen initiatives in 1998 protecting our waterways, air, and communities, public health from chemical toxins. We appreciate the growth from listening, learning from our residents' concerns of environmental protections from our city leaders. However, words, best science, targets, best practices are just words without the action. What we need is action, implementing the change to improve our air, water, and lands. Why do we have to wait years until the climate action plan is completed. The calls for Climate Action, Climate Commitment Act, and to update the comprehensive plans with 1099 protections from our King County executive legislators in our District 1 and 46, as well as from our governor, are loud and clear. Our residents and climate are suffering, and it may be too late. We live in a community where many live daily, picking up litter, recycling every item, planting seedlings, leaving less of a carbon footprint. We have many organizations that are helping bring the word and the education forward. How many practices can the city change to conserve our resources, decrease our greenhouse gases, support preservation of our trees, air, wetlands, waterlands, and land? Our climate is in crisis. And if we don't continue, if we continue to cement our natural habitat, grant permit variances to encroach on our wetlands, clear cutting the trees, our waterways, lands and air will be destroyed. Our residents and climate are suffering. Take action now before it is too late. On Missy Middle, the bill was clear. We were supposed to build all different types of housing. If we already have so many market and bonus rate units, we need to build low and extremely low affordable housing. So we have housing at all levels. The mayor announced a new first time all affordable housing, but it will be market rate yet again for couples earning $195,000 annually. They don't need affordable housing. They could buy a house. Who needs affordable housing is our low income workers that are making 50K and below living in the tents and cards or couch surfing. Stacey, thank you, Stacy. that's your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stacy, for uh, sticking with us and, and uh, speaking again at our public hearing. Appreciate it. So our next person, I didn't write it down. I wrote that's down Stacy's name. Yep. Next, up? we have uh, Peter Lance, and then Chris Olson, and then James Olson, and John Hendrickson. Okay, well, you oh. know, my mind <laughs> can't remember them all, but Peter, I believe you are up. There you are, Peter Lance. And Peter, we can see you and hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try not to ramble too much here. Uh, I've been thinking about these issues a lot. Uh, they kind of bother me, big picture. What is the world going to look like in 2050? Uh, Kenmore going to look like? What's your legacy going to be? I'm concerned about the missing middle approach. I understand we've got a housing issue. However, we have an aging, we've got an old town, old city. A lot of the housing stock and buildings are uh, not, well, they're just aging out. They're going to age out in the coming, in coming days, coming years. Uh, what would you do? if 
we started with Kim Moore with a clean sheet of paper. How would you plan this? I live in a nice neighborhood, McDonald Highlands behind Arrowhead School. I do not believe good planning would have the nice single family houses that are here now, but it would be some sort of uh, higher density uh, use application. Your, your wise planners would have, I'm next to a school, next to a state park. Uh, more people should live here than live here now uh, in some fashion. Uh, and it kind of bothers me that we're going to have duplexes and triplexes perhaps wandering around this Arrowhead area. And as these houses are aging out, you guys are making encouraging high value investments of new duplexes and triplexes in this area, which realistically, if you start with a clean piece of paper, you might scrape it all and have a higher density here on the Arrowhead, Arrowhead area, which gets around to my idea that this feels like a European approach, ancient European approach to housing. Somebody built a house on a goat trail and everything was fine. And then somebody wanted to build another house next to it and that was okay, they could jam it in there. And before you knew it, you had a, you had a whole city dwelling around a bunch of goat trails. And what we'd have is a bunch of housing packed in here around some subdivision, some developer planned years ago to suit single family housing when wise clean sheet of paper planning might very well be something entirely different for Arrowhead. And I'm just picking this one out as an example, but we've got a lot of aging houses. Average house lives lasts hundred years. If you got planned on letting these things age out and then have higher development, you plan on higher density developments or what you would do if you're starting with a clean piece of paper, which really means starting almost all over with what you've got here. And you guys have done a lot of work. I mean, I've got to commend you. I've looked at all your, all the information you guys have pulled together. You've got a lot of it. You know a lot about the population, what's going to happen over time. Mr. Lance? Yes. That's, that's your three minutes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for sticking around and providing us your comments during the public hearing. They're very appreciated. You're welcome. So, Rita? Now, I didn't remember all those names you listed. So who's next? Uh, I'm just kind of giving them a heads up that they're they're on deck. <laughs> that's great. So, well, that's yeah. better than me. I mean, maybe they can remember. So, <laughs> of course. Next, we I have think Chris. I see Peter there. Is that uh, right? looks like uh, Chris Olson is next. Oh, Chris Olson. Peter, you have to go. Oh, no, I'm sorry. sorry about that. Peter just, I'm, I'm just got to go done. Away. Okay. Yep, yeah. I'm. You're okay. fine, Peter. I have to move. Oh, you you're still there. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Chris, you're up. No worries. People seem to be keeping quiet anyway, so it's not a huge issue. But um, I, I kind of agree with what Peter was just saying, I suppose. Um, I, I agree with higher density, centralized housing facilities. Um, that being said, I do like the method of having um, a combination of low, medium, and higher density housing kind of mixed together a bit more um, as opposed to just separating it. I also am looking at this Arrowhead Drive on Google Maps and it looks like it might be a bit of a cul-de-sac which might be a reason why they're looking at using duplexes and triplexes as opposed to denser um, construction just given that there is a proclivity to drive and it has, oh sorry, it's not completely a, a cul-de-sac. It's got a second exit if you go through the neighborhood streets but that would encourage a lot of driving through neighborhood streets um, as opposed to main roads, um, potentially. So I guess the item that I was kind of curious about is it was mentioned that there is a 0.75 per unit parking maximum. Is there a minimum set by the state? Um, or does that depend on how the city defines transportation needs under the Growth Management Act? Um, my understanding was that was up to the city. And if, if possible, we could further decrease surface parking, which would help a lot of the issues people have brought up tonight, including um, wastewater treatment and surface runoff. Um, I think that would, if, if that was made as a standard across the city, that would probably reduce significantly more hardscape than removing one trail, which would allow people to walk and bike as opposed to being forced to drive, um, forcing parking spaces across the city, 
which are going to have runoff um, where cars have been sitting and those are going to be, that's gonna be the type of runoff that's carrying heavy metals, um, oils and other um, pollutants. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of my question is, is there a way that parking um, variances can be requested? So locations of people who you know don't want to have a car can have an option to live in a place and pay for a place where they don't have to pay for vehicle infrastructure. They aren't forced into that. So, um, Chris, as it is, yeah. Unfortunately, this is not the um, situation where we can do question and answers. Uh, what we would, um, I think that in your sentence or two after you asked that first question, you pretty much made the point of what you were concerned about. At least I got it. I don't know about my other, my fellow members, but. Um, I would say, and this is not taking up your three minutes, and this is for <laughs> anyone else, that you are welcome to call Lori um, and ask her that question or call one of us aside and ask that question. We will get an answer for you. But unfortunately, we just cannot get into question and answers during a public hearing. That would not be right for others or yourself because we can't give Definitely, you a no. of answer. And we appreciate your question. Yeah, no, that, that, thank you for saying that. Um, I, this is the first public hearing I've been able to attend in Kenmore. Um, I recently moved into the city. Uh, and yeah, anyways, that makes perfect sense. And I'll give Lori a message. Um, I'm assuming I can also send comments that I have about this plan directly to you guys at the email. I saw that there was a 5 p.m. deadline so I'm tempted to just. Well, you're ask welcome. To. Anyway, sorry, I'm asking more questions. No, so, no, that's now that your question. Anyone, anyone, can send us an email about anything at any time, and if you send it to Lori, she will copy or move or forward it, shall we say, to all of us, so that we will all read it, and it will be considered public comments in the next meeting that we have. So it will be actually published in the agenda bill for the following meeting. So your email uh, requesting information will have, um, will be seen by everybody. Um, all right, in that case, I'll get back to my point and try and make it concise and not ask uh, open-ended questions. Mr. Olson, can I just let you know that you have 45 seconds left? Thank you. Yeah, um, you. I, I did some more review of that trail connection, and it looks like that can almost be connected past 83rd up to 88th, where there is a connection point. Um, I'm also hoping the city could look into coordinating with the city of Bothell to have a have the trail go past 80th Avenue and go all the way to Northeast 180th um, in order to make that trail, the toll pipeline trail connection, more direct towards downtown Bothell. Um, to serve more cities or more city residents and limit the need to drive. Um, anyways, I think that's going to do it for me tonight. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate your patience and your comments. Now, the question is, is who's next, Rita? Uh, next, we have James Olson. And James Olson, I see your picture there, James. But you're muted. So that there we go. Up, oh, I can hear you now. I'm going to get my camera on here. Just a second. Oh, good. Choose video. Choose virtual background. My picture always looks better than what I do on on video. So I'll do that. Maybe. All right. Probably for my picture up. I look younger that way. Too. Still not doing it. Let's try that again. Start video. Let's see if that works. Can you see me? Oh, there you go. Awesome. Sweet. Um, yeah, I'm James Olson, and I this is my first meeting as well. Um, I moved into Kenmore uh, last November. Um, I moved one reason I and I and I bought a house here. Um, I moved to Kenmore primarily because it's very close to the trail. So it's easy for me to bike um, and get around that way as opposed to using a car. Um, and hence less impact on the environment. Um, 
And but I, I do want to bring a couple points up and, and recommendations just as a new person to Kenmore. One, um, I bought my house for a million dollars. I'll be clear with you, it's not a, it doesn't look like a million dollar house, at least to me. Uh, the reality is that's what people have to pay for to get a house nowadays. Um, luckily, I've been able to work myself up into a position where I get paid a lot. That said, I don't think most people can. So I don't find that very fair. And that's the nature of what we live in. So this is where I kind of bring up my recommendations. One, the house I bought has an ADU, but it's not certified. So we're kind of going through the process of certifying it. Um, so it's important that you enable that process because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of uncertified ADUs in your in your town or in the city. Uh, two, um, the things I agree with that kind of go along this is, and to bring the cost down is um, we, we need housing density. We need to have too much parking um, and we have too much single, what I would call single occupancy vehicles going through the city, um, especially on 522, uh, which is detrimental to your city and most of those people won't actually come from the city. Um, so on, on this density issue, highly support having more duplexes and tri triplexes, but balancing them out. Um, I don't, and I believe mixing those in and not having zones for duplexes versus triplexes. I also warn you to be careful as far as, and I you know, do know you have a rule for this, that you have to live in the house for six months before um, it can be rented out to someone else, which I highly recommend because you have companies right now going in and paying cash to buy houses and they just turn around and rent them out, uh, which keep people from being able to uh, live in those houses because they're upping their rents by 30%. Um, the other thing is, and another person talked about this, having parking variances. I actually want to have a parking garage for bikes in my house um, and reduce the amount of footprint that I have for cars. Again, because, uh, and that allows more people to use it. So that's where I'm asking for variances and being able to do something in that matter. Um, smart densities, I gave you example, triplexes, duplexes, um, allowing more density, but in an intelligent manner. Just putting in large parking, uh, large, um, uh, how do I put this? Apartment buildings is actually detrimental. If you get too much density, without intelligent density, that's gonna make things far worse in your city. Um, and then the last piece on it was better trail connection because that reduces your number of single vehicles, uh, single Carlson. vehicles, and that's it. Yes. Oh, that, that's your time, thank you. I kind of planned it out to go to my <laughs> full max time. So awesome. thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, James. Appreciate your uh, patience and all your comments. We've made plenty of notes. That's what I do. And I know several other members uh, were not not paying attention. We're trying to write fast while all of I, I totally understand. I totally understand where you're coming at. I, I, I came from over the Bothell area and have dealt with there. So there's some similarity. So um, I hope it's yeah. not too much similarity. Anyway, <laughs> that was I shouldn't have said that. OK, no, I, I know what you mean. But yes. OK, okay. thank you, Mark. Uh, Mike, I hope I didn't overstep that one. Um, <laughs> Okay, Rita, who's next? Next, we have John Hendrickson. And if you give me just a moment, I can promote him to panelist. John, we, and now you're unmuted. Oh, Wait, I think I? you are. Oh, there you, you are, and I see you. Thank okay, you, guys. Go ahead. Could I have a clock, please, before I start? You know, the city has is well versed in this technology. We do it at this council meetings. Why don't we do it here? It's not fair because we don't know when our time's running out. Rita, uh, would you time. please let him know when he's got a minute and 30 seconds <clears throat> left? I mean, sure, a minute you're... and then 30 seconds left. Yes, your time will start as soon as you begin to speak, Mr. Hendrickson. Okay, thank you, guys. Yeah, this missing middle thing is a lot like the ADU. Uh, it's really a scam. It's a sound bite. It's a total head game. It's uh, fraudulently manipulates the commissioners to undermine the public process and make you feel guilty for living in a single family zone. They're, they're going around saying a lot of things that it's racist to live in a single family home. There's housing inequity. There's all kinds of social injustice. And they say single family zoning is exclusive and not inclusive. Well, when is it inclusive? 
You know, if you go back to Abraham Lincoln, when he was serving in the house in Illinois, he was 28 years old when they moved to Springfield, the capital. He, he went in, he couldn't even afford a bed. And the guy that was, he couldn't afford a bed on time. And the guy said, well, we have rooms. You can have a roommate and rent a room upstairs. So he did at 28. And, he, and those guys shared a single bed, two guys in a bed. So back in, in 1838, the missing middle was in between Abraham Lincoln and that guy. And that's where you need to sleep because that's inclusive. Otherwise, anything else is exclusive. You don't even have a right, ultimately a right to your own bedroom if you're gonna say private property is exclusive and it's racist and it's, it's inequitable and it's social injustice, it's nonsense. So what you're going to do is, and we've already changed, we've eliminated the home ownership requirement. And what that does with the ADUs, and that just encourages corporate investment. You got big money, corporate investors coming in, buying up 30% of the houses that are going up for sale. And your policies are making that happen. They're, they're not telling you everything that's going on. You're being conned. Less than one minute left. This is a social activist policy. Um, in, in reality, the missing middle policy is designed to end single family zoning and ultimately have stacked flats four to five stories high without public safety protections for surface water management, pedestrian safety, uh, social, social safety, no parking. People aren't going to get along. It's crazy. And then they want you to live, work, and play right there. Don't drive a car. 30 seconds About. left. So why don't you focus on really, listen to Lori, Lori Anderson talk about the vision statement. We, our vision statement used to be we were going to protect the quality of life and have a balanced approach. They took that out of the vision statement. No one even knows it. No one knows it around town. And they're giving you all this malarkey about racial discrimination, housing inequity. This is a, in my opinion, just a social activist policy. Really, Debbie Bent, in my opinion, has been pushing this since ever since I've known her. And I've known her since 2003. And she's very influential more than anybody here. Mr. Hendrickson, that's and your she time. She doesn't give us all the information. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate you sticking around and, and giving us your comments. Rita, who do we have up next? I see no other hands at this time. If you want, oh, just one just popped up. One second. Um, looks like we have Elizabeth Mooney. If you okay. give me just a minute, I will promote her to panelist. Miss Mooney, go ahead. Elizabeth, I don't see you and I don't hear you. But now I think I hear you. And now I think I will be able to see you too. <laughs> hello, hello. I really think three minutes is probably not enough for all the stuff that you're dealing with, but that's somebody else's comment, I think also. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm gonna do my best right now, Planning Commission, I think, um, it's too much too fast, in my opinion, that you're trying to um, have us as a community comment on and give you proper democratic um, um, response. As far as what Peter Lance said, yeah, I think what, what comes to mind is this is just a piecemeal approach. It's not your fault, but you know, like I said in earlier, I, I think, well, let's just get down to the basics because public works. The public works um, facility up at Kenmore Junior High, first of all, because of COVID and because of construction, I went over and I saw the sign because I knew this was coming up. And um, there are not many people, by the way, who come to your planning commissions. And I think that that's unfortunate because I think there are a lot of people who care about what you're dealing with. And in three minutes, I can't do it a good job. But um, the sign doesn't even, there aren't even many of the, the pieces of paper there. I went and talked to Todd Bergman, his brother. I don't approve of the planning uh, of the public works going forward. I want you to stop it until we have more people comment on it so more people can even get by there. That is a, a, a it's not because your fault, but yes, great building, six and a half million dollars. Excuse me, but I really don't want that happening right now. So please do not rezone it. 
and let us talk about it later. And maybe it'll go down where the um, vector property, the vector people might not even take over Lake Point. And then you'll see, like Janet Wilson is talking about, there's a model toxics control act site and ecology didn't have to. So anyway, okay. So public works, please don't rezone it. Give us a chance to talk about it in a much, you know, it's city hall when we get a chance to go back. Two, Lake Forest Park is ahead of us. And I don't like that. So the first priority, and when Lori Anderson was talking about what is being changed, I mean, it just makes my heart go pitter patter. Good grief. The highest priority in, in my opinion, and I'm sorry, I'm all upset. Um, <laughs> the highest priority should be first and foremost, do not give any variances and, and change your zoning so that the first thing you do is you protect the streams, the wetlands, the buffers. No, and, and then you get at least to a point that you're as good as Lake Forest Park. I don't wanna be the drive-by city. I remember when we incorporated and Emily said that Kenmore's the drive-by city. And look at the asphalt and, and, and concrete. Okay, um, the tree protection and, oh, the toll pipeline. Lovely comment by the earlier gentleman. You can bike from Kenmore to Bothell without cutting up the um, large wetland there. And even if you didn't care about the migration of the wildlife that need that particular <laughs> wetland. Ms. Tony, that, that's your three minutes. I, I think I sh can I say one more thing? Can I, can I say one more thing? Because the cost of that, our own city manager said it's too much. So stop wasting our time on that. And good grief, please give people longer on this um, this hearing. I'm one of the few that. Thank you, Elizabeth. You got to finish your sentence or two. So um, I appreciate you being patient with us. And um, thank you very much. Uh, Rita, is there anyone else? I don't see any more hands at this time, but if you wanna give it a minute. I think that would be. And while the, you're giving it a minute, I'd like to remind everybody that's listening to us, as well as our commissioners when they hear from folks, is that everybody is welcome to do two things. One is to come and, and talk to us every other week during public comments and let us know what you think and what you feel and what you think we should do. So that's why we have public uh, comments every single meeting, including this one. Um, and then the second thing, you're always welcome to have a long email if you need and send it to, uh, you can send it to any one of us, but preferably to Lori, because Lori then will send it out to all of us. And if you send it only to one of us, then we have to send it to Lori for her to send it out because we all have to see everything that's emailed to us at the city. So um, we do take um, all of you seriously when you say that you're concerned that there's a lot in all of these attachments and maybe three minutes is not enough time to talk, but please send us your notes in writing and feel, f and you are still free to call us individually, not in more than groups of, of three, to uh, talk to us about your concerns, uh, pro or con. So with that, Rita, did we come up with mm. another person? We did. Mm, we have Emily. Emily. Uh, let's see, where are you? Hi. Hi. Hi Here Emily. we are. Hi, Hi. Emily. Sorry, I was confused by the, um, the the notice notification that came up. Oh, that's um, okay. Your three minutes will start now. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't been on uh, this, these uh, town hall meetings very often, but in the past, I was very pro um, tree wilderness, keeping the character, the wooded character of Kenmore. It's really um, makes me um, more than sad to see these trees go down and replaced by these little fast growing sticks that the developers put up knowing that they're gonna die just before the projects get sold, which is probably strategic, my, my theory. Um, and I just wanted to tell all the people who spoke before, I um, completely support you. I think that Kenmore is so special or used to be more special with its um, 
uh, trees and canopies. And I, it just, it makes me sad to think that I feel like there's nothing I can do except voice my opinion and help uh, the other people who feel the same way know that they're not alone. And um, I just feel there should be more education about nature. And with that might trickle down into more emphasis on bikes and less cars. And I think all the things that everybody's talking about um, would probably dovetail nicely with the emphasis on nature. Um, and that's, and I hope that going forward with whatever happens, I live uh, within a thousand feet of this project that's getting, um, um, that, that we're talking about tonight. Um, I hope that when it goes forward, that the streams, the runoff, the cars and all that stuff will be mitigated. I also do feel like things are happening way too fast. And I only just found out about this meeting. Um, I have less time to pay attention to these mailers and I happen to see it and that's why I'm here tonight. So if anybody wants help, um, I'm here to volunteer. I will help you do all these native plantings or whatever. So um, that's all, thanks. I can't hear you, Dwight, you're on mute. You mentioned project. I wasn't sure which project you were talking about. The, um, the <laughs> sorry, I don't know it. I, um, I don't know the proper name of it. The just, uh, planning so I, for the, the um, public works okay. project. Okay, I just wanted, we've been talking about a couple different things. So that's what you're referring to. Thank yeah. you. Well, I do think it's all intermixed. It's very connected. Everything. I just I, I asked that in clarification for the minutes so that it's clear in the minutes what you're responding. Well, to. I hope this for any project, right. so not just this one. Okay. Okay, Rita. Thank you, thank you very much, Emily. Welcome. Um, I, yeah, I see no other hands at this time. Okay, this is your last chance, folks. If you wish to speak at the public hearing. This is your last chance to put your hand up electronically or otherwise so that Rita can see you. I see one more hand. Oh, see, there we go. I see Randy. So if you give me just one second, I can promote Randy to panelist. Randy, we cannot see you and we cannot hear you. So please unmute. We'll give Randy just a minute here. Oh, I heard it. Mike, go on. Am I, do you have me up yet? Yes, we are up. We cannot see you, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, and that's okay. There we go. Oh, we can now see you and hear you. Yeah, thank you for uh, taking this time to, to listen to my perspective. I'm a 60-year uh, resident in Kenmore. I'm also a builder I've, um, uh, and developer. I've been um, um, built probably 40 or 50 homes in Kenmore over my um, career. And as I res the, uh, although I respect the uh, voices from many who are concerned about uh, impervious surface and parking. Um, I, I believe that uh, directly south of the public works project that would be sandwiched between 202nd and uh, possibly 198th, maybe even a little further south, that you're considering that as a 
uh, lower density for um, duplexes and triplexes. Um, and I, I may be wrong on that, but I'm just trying to interpret your map. If in fact it's true, I don't know if any of you have ever traveled on the Northeast 198th and almost daily that road is choked down to about a lane and a half due to the fact that there's so much parking that transpires on on a perceived shoulder that really doesn't exist and uh, as as great as it sounds to reduce traffic and to get us off the road that reality isn't going to happen this decade or next and the uh the, the fix in the meantime is only going to make things worse as far as the 0.75 uh density uh for parking uh i would highly encourage you even though as a builder and investor i would highly encourage you to reconsider where and how all of that parking um could exist because i i perceive uh in a duplex, you're going to have a family, you're probably going to have mom and dad driving. And let's even take it to a triplex. With that in mind, that's six vehicles at a bare minimum trying to park in uh, a 50 by 100 foot space. There is no way you're going to be able to design garage and or on site parking for that. So beware as you create these densities you're going to have major parking issues just like seattle has done in ignoring uh on-site parking so uh, uh, that, that's your three minutes okay thank you thank you thank you randy thanks for hanging in there bet now i'm not going to Say too Mr. Much Thompson, longer, um, I can. Rita, Rita, do you have anyone else? Oh, Eliana, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if uh, I should make another announcement in Spanish in case there's anybody there that maybe wants to make a comment. Would that be good to do now? Yes. Maybe. Okay. Thank you. Um, Buenas noches otra vez. Queríamos darle la oportunidad a las personas que quieran hacer cualquier comentario en español. Esta es su oportunidad. Hay dos intérpretes presentes. Si alguien quiere decir algo, con mucho gusto, este es el momento. So, Rita. Do we see anyone responding to Elena's message? Uh, not yet. If you want to give it just a minute. Okay, we will. Poor Randy, he's 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 trying to get off, but I am. <laughs> I'm working on it on the back end. Sorry oh, about that. <laughs> oh, you got, you've been cut off now, Randy. Sorry about that. Um, Chair Thompson, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah, you know, you, you can get one question in. Perfect. Um, it looks like Chris Olson raised his hand again, but has lowered it. I'm, I'm not sure if he wanted to give another comment. Is that allowed or? No, one comment is three minutes. Unless he didn't use up his three minutes, then uh, unless there's an objection from the commissioners, but everyone received three minutes. And so to allow another, another round, I think, would not necessarily be fair. Uh, Mr. Olson can certainly send us an email at whatever length he desires. Thank you for that. I see no more hands at this time. Okay, seeing no more individuals, this is your last chance, so put your hand up fast. Um, I'm going to uh, close the public hearing 
on the Comprehensive Plan and Development Regulation Amendments uh, stated on the um, agenda for May 17th, 2022, uh, regarding the eight attachments in the staff memo of May 17th, 2022. Hearing no further comment, the public hearing is now closed. So, uh, members of the commission, would you um, want to take a five minute break and then come back and, and run quickly through the uh, staff memo for that uh, Lori wants us to run through? Is that all right? Five minutes, uh, the, the meeting is in recess until five, um, till uh, 832. So Nathan, how's, is it house school still? Yes, we're actually reading, uh, getting really close to finals season. So the next couple of weeks are gonna be packed full.
That's great. Oh, that's about. Anyway, um, well, you know, you can always take some advice from the Yale grad over there. You know, she's really got it down. You know, you look a lot who, like my daughter. Who are you talking about, Dwight? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I look like your daughter. Yeah, my daughter's a Princeton grad. Evan forbid. <laughs> I've actually been to Yale in the it's swimming pool there. In the swimming pool? It's a beautiful campus. It is. It's a lovely campus. I'm sure you spent plenty of time there. In the swimming pool? No, in at Yale, <laughs> wandering around <laughs> looking at the campus. Yes, I did that. Yeah. I don't think I actually went, ever went to the swimming pool though. <laughs> no, it's an old one. It's it's kind of in the sort of a bait. It's an old natatorium. It's really quite something, actually. Um, so anyway, I'll have to go back. We are about ready, Rita. Are we ready to record again? We've never stopped recording. Oh well, that was off the record anyway for anyone that's listening. So you hear that? So yes, we I still call, have an audience here too. <laughs> oh, I know. So we have a. That's okay. So we have now a, uh, we're back in session. I wanted uh, for the uh, good of the public hearing, wanted to indicate uh, for the record that uh, we have published the three minute um, time limit on the agenda. And we also had published on the agenda that um, topics for the public hearing uh, would be heard during the public hearing and not during public comments, which is a normal and customary approach to have items and, and issues that our citizens bring to us to be properly placed in the public hearing so that those comments can be reviewed by the city council once our recommendations go forward. So I wanted to... Uh, point that out and go on the record. So that would be in the minutes uh, of this meeting. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the commissioners on that item? Lovely. Hearing none, uh, we're going to go to uh, agenda item number six. Uh, Lori, you get the first few minutes, as many as you want. I'm not going to limit you to three. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. So at your last meeting, there was a discussion in the mid missing middle code amendments about uh, a driveway that would run down the side yard of a lot. And there was to be a three foot landscape strip for screening. And originally, the way that uh, screening was described, it was supposed to be uh, shrub, evergreen shrubs. And commissioners raised the question about uh, the importance of native vegetation and whether, in fact, uh, native vegetation might be a more appropriate choice. So, uh, and then there was a discussion about noxious weeds and making sure that the city wasn't allowing people to put noxious uh, weeds into their uh, landscape strip. So I provided background information in the memo uh, and uh, we do have a definition for noxious weeds, they are prohibited. And then I did some research into uh, native screening and looked at the list of uh, Pacific Northwest uh, native shrubs. And in the course of that, it looked like there were about four that were of the appropriate height. There are many that grow quite tall, uh, but in a three foot landscape strip, it seemed that they might be too big. Uh, so those four were the evergreen huckleberry, Oregon grape, Oregon box and Salal. Uh, so the planning commission could say uh, you can, there are a lot more deciduous shrubs, uh, native deciduous shrubs. And the question was, is the main focus to be on screening or is the main focus to be on native uh, vegetation? We didn't hear any comments about that tonight, although we inserted that question into uh, the draft uh, regulations. So one approach would be to require only native shrubs and to do a solid screen, you would have a limited number of choices. 
uh, for native evergreen shrubs. The other choice would be to say, well, include na native shrubs, but you also can choose other evergreen shrubs uh, to provide that same level of screening. Uh, the third choice would be just require native vegetation shrubs. <laughs> and uh, then you would probably end up with a mix of evergreen and deciduous shrubs. And after looking at uh, the question, staff is recommending this third option. The, the driveway is not a place for parking. So really the only impact of the driveway is as the car is driving down the side yard into parking in the back of the lot, uh, so I suppose in, in, uh, it could be headlights, uh, transitory headlights, and then just the impression of the uh, asphalt, the 10 foot wide strip of asphalt along the side yard. And, and staff's conclusion was that a mix of evergreen and deciduous shrubs, native shrubs, would certainly um, do a good job of screening the asphalt itself. And for, uh, quite a bit of the year it would do a good job screening the headlights uh, and so we felt like that third approach requiring native shrubs but allowing them to either be evergreen or deciduous was an appropriate choice okay comments from the commissioners or questions mr nathan Lori, how does fencing play into this? If, uh, say, a property owner wanted to put up a fence to block the driveway instead? Yeah, that is a, a that's in the standards already. So it's either a three foot landscaping strip with vegetation, or you can do a six foot property line fence as an alternative. Okay, so this is just as an alternative to that. Correct. Okay, thank you. Further comments? Tracy? So the in the recommendation three, it would be require the use of native shrubs, including some evergreen species, whether native or not native. Is that? No, I, I, no. option three uh, was exclusively native shrubs, including some evergreen species. OK. Just so it's no percentage of specified of whether they're evergreen, evergreen or not or evergreen. Right. Okay, but they're all native. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't know where my mind is. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> Anyone else? Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, I I like option three. I mean, I would rather not be completely limited to three or four varieties. That doesn't really um, give a lot of options there. And uh, the more options we can get, the better. I think native makes sense. Um, they're obviously gonna be healthier and less maintenance. So that should please everybody, but uh, the more options, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Is there any other comments that before we go ahead, Nathan? This is just my personal opinion. I'm putting this out there. I don't know. We can maybe talk about it a little bit more. I don't really feel comfortable, I guess, policing the percentage and the so many number of plants people put in their yard. I feel like that's not quite the position of the commission. I like the broader approach of number three by just saying, you know, native species or even limiting it to just uh, excluding invasive and non-native or something like that. But in terms of setting uh, so many percentage of your, your flower bed has to be one type of plant or, or these four types of plants, I, I feel like that's unnecessary on our behalf. And I think broader, a broader approach in terms of at least appearance and thinking back, what are we connecting here? We're, we're trying to, um, you know, pr protect from, from view the driveway, but also at the same time, consider um, at least promoting native plants here. So I, I guess for me out of these three options would be um, number three without percentages specified. Um, 
but I'm curious to hear what other, others think, and I'm still processing this myself. And a point of clarification, a question for Lori along those lines, is the yellow highlighted uh, number three at the top of your um, memo, is that the number three that is being discussed? So uh, the number three at the top of the memo is the current language uh, in the recommendation. So this was the language you wanted to revisit. So it currently says landscaping shall minimally consist of a mix of evergreen and deciduous shrubs spaced no more than six feet on center and with an ultimate height of at least five five feet along with garden plantings. Okay. But the question was whether you wanted to specify that it needed to be native uh, shrubs. And if you went with op option three, uh, we would leave in the language about it being a mix of evergreen and deciduous shrubs, but not specify how many of each. We would, I, I would recommend that you still keep the planting uh, spacing requirements because people won't know how many plants to plant and we do need to have a minimum number of plantings if we're going to consider it any kind of a screen. Okay so I mean stop me if I'm you were talking about the I don't see where the am I missing something I don't see where the percentages are in that number three that's yellow am I missing something? The percentages were in a couple of earlier options. Oh, options. Uh, okay. They're not in that yellow. Correct. Thing. Okay, great. I that's what I wanted to make sure I wasn't confused. I'm easily confused at my older age. So um, thank you, Nathan. Yeah you're, yeah, you're welcome. I was just gonna say I was looking at the policy options on the very last page of our of our entire packet. That's what I was looking at and referencing percentages. That's fine. I just want I I was thinking ahead of what we needed to do to get this over with. So that clarified that. Tracy, it's your turn. Okay, this is just a question of clarification again, Lori, uh, similarly along the lines of my first one. So policy option one, the difference between that and three is that in one, so in one and three, we're requiring native plants, be they shrubs or evergreen, in one and three. But in one, we're requiring a certain percentage of no, the evergreen. No. In one, uh, we're saying a significant percentage, undefined, uh, that have to be evergreen species, uh, native evergreen species. Um, but because there are a limited number of those species, it wouldn't be very diverse. You'd have a whole bunch of potentially um, uh, evergreen huckleberry or Oregon grape. It, uh -huh. it would be almost like a monoculture yeah. of, uh, between those four species. Option two was to say, okay, if you wanna stick with evergreens, then require some native species, but also allow non-native evergreen species. Mm -hmm. And then option three says, we want all native species and we don't really care whether they're evergreen or deciduous. Okay, Thank you. all right. Thank you for that. I don't know mm -hmm. why it's so confusing to me. Maybe I'm just tired, but I appreciate your help. Um, and I will just say that very briefly, I'm in favor of requiring all native species for um, wildlife, supporting wildlife and biodiversity and supporting our native ecosystems. Is there any further comments or discussion? Yes, Nathan. Um, well, I haven't been to the nursery anytime recently to look at tree prices, but I'm curious, do native trees and plants, is there a significant cost difference between the two? If I had to go pick up an evergreen tree versus another form of tree? Because now, now I'm thinking about also the, just how we're wording it, burden put on the, the owner to pick a more costly alternative. I'm just curious. Um, I, I don't know all 
costs of landscaping materials, uh, I can say we weren't talking about trees. I think in a three foot landscape strip, I, I'm not sure that trees would be the right thing. I will say that all of these nurseries in the area carry native plants and I'm not aware of any substan. I mean, I'm sure there are rare native plants that cost more than common native plants, but to buy a, a snowberry or to buy a um, an Oregon grape, I don't think is any more, it may be in fact less expensive than buying some sort of uh, uh, unique rare species that you usually don't see around here. So I, I can't imagine that there would be a significant difference. But again, I'm, I'm not a landscaper. I don't, I can't say that 100%. Now Derek had his hand up there and then I don't, Whenever I see Debbie's face show up, that means she probably <laughs> wants to talk. But Derek, you raised your hand before Debbie um, put her video. Uh, I, I've actually been to the nursery very recently um, out there at Flower World. I love it out there. Um, as long as we're not requiring 15 foot tall pineapple trees, <laughs> we're way better off with the native plants and shrubs uh, price wise. Uh, it's these are much cheaper than the other stuff that will inevitably die soon um, if you bring it home. So native is definitely the way to go for price and longevity. I just wanted to make sure we weren't asking citizens to, you know, you have to ship in or bring in native plants from down in Vancouver, Washington or something like that and put an undue burden on them. But I think with what you're saying, Derek, I think that helps at least clarify my point and put me a little bit more at ease about this. And on that point, I will second Derek's position. My esteemed better half has this huge garden that I'm looking at through my window, not to the back side, but that way I look out. And she goes to Flower World and everywhere else to go and buy things. And with my truck, I have to bring them home. And I can assure you that uh, Derek's right on on that because it's a lot cheaper to buy native and the stuff that you're talking about versus things that are much more ornate and um, those cost a lot more and, and Derek's right depends on the size of what you're buying if you're buying a six a 10 foot tree that's going to cost a whole lot more than a four or five foot starter so that I, 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 I'm not an expert, but having been to Flower World and everywhere else a lot, I'm going to vote with Derek on this. So now Debbie has, is just waiting to say something. I can tell. Um, I, I'm not an expert on plants either, but um, we could check in with Public Works. Jennifer Gordon is an expert on plants and has a lot of experience on how plants survive in certain kinds of environment. Um, you know, sometimes you want plants to survive and maybe depending on where they're planted, maybe natives might not be the best choice for survivability. So again, I think having flexibility is, is always good. And again, if we want to, to check with um, staff. Um, I'm sure Jennifer would be happy to, to give an opinion um, if planning commission give a direction. Well, we don't, we, whatever way we go tonight, we will still revisit this item so we could do something initially and then we can get some feedback from our staff. Is that possible, Debbie? Yes, that's possible. Absolutely. Any further comments from the illustrious commissioners? Hearing none, what do you, someone has a proposal on what we want to at least put in some soft mud or cement, whichever you prefer? I move that we recommend policy option three. It's been moved. Has it been seconded? I second it. It's seconded by Muriel. So it's been moved and seconded that um, we direct the um, staff to write the appropriate 
language for option number three to be included into the document for final consideration with the caveat that the staff is going to give us a least either a, a verbal feedback or maybe a very short memo about um, the items that Debbie spoke to. That's a caveat, not in the motion, but I think we all agree. <clears throat> so there's a motion and a second before the commission related to option three. Uh, is there any uh, anyone that's not clear what we're voting on? Is there any objection to this motion? Hearing no objection, then the motion is carried unanimously. So be it. So, wow. Okay. That's wonderful. Let me go back up to the top here. Anything for the <laughs> good of the order? Now we do have a regular meeting, right? Just to make sure we have a regular meeting the first Tuesday of next month, correct, Lori? I see you, Mike. <laughs> Uh, yes, and, and I need to let you know that this is going to be a different kind of meeting, and I don't know that I have the final answer at this point, but the City Council has requested that hybrid meetings, uh, starting on June 1st, we have to have an in-person component to our public meetings. Uh, Governor Inslee rescinded a proclamation that required that all meetings be held remotely. What that means is that it either will be an in-person meeting at City Hall in the City Council Chambers, or it will be a hybrid meeting, meaning that it will be a combination of in-person meeting and uh, virtual meeting over Zoom. And I don't know the ultimate outcome. The, um, the city council and the city clerk are discussing that issue and we are right up front toward the beginning of June. So we'll, we'll need to know in a timely way what to expect. But I think uh, the message that I would like to communicate and Debbie will uh, reinforce this or add to it is that there's a possibility that that meeting on June 7th will be in person. And uh, I think several of you have not had in-person uh, meetings in the council chambers. Uh, so heads up, <laughs> the times they are a changing. That's what we can say. Okay, so you'll let us know as soon as you know some more about that. And so you've put us on notice to change our calendars to show in person, and then we can figure out between now and then what the rules are going to be. Mike, you have been patient. It's your turn. That can happen sometimes. Not very often, but that can be patient at time. Uh, my question was, uh, should we change our calendars for the June 7th meeting to be in person? And I guess the answer is, we don't know yet. So thank you, Lori. One thing uh, I'll just put out there for us to be thinking about, uh, do we have a preference um, in terms of, uh, I'm assuming if we have an in-person meeting, does that mean there could be a mix for commissioners of being in-person or remote? Hybrid. Yep. Well, I heard that was what, when I read the memo from the city, it sounded like hybrid was going to be in-person for city council members, but the hybrid piece of it would be that you know, folks who wanted to make comment uh, could call in. So I guess maybe we need to have some clarification on that. Does hybrid mean that uh, commissioners or council, uh, city council folks could have a choice of being in person or remote? Uh, uh, no, no. Something we don't have an answer to. No. We, we don't. That's, that's the, the short answer is, I think that's what we're trying to figure out in terms of what it means by hybrid. And there are a lot of technical pieces to figure that out. Um, so I think what we're, we're saying is um, 
I guess if we can't figure out the hybrid portion so that you, the commission and or staff and or the public could be in present or, or online, the fallback position would be an in-person meeting where the planning commission would be at City Hall. That's plan B if we can't figure out the technical side of it. I think there are some um, mock meetings uh, that staff are working on to, to try and figure out some of the technical pieces, so stay tuned. Nathan? I was going to bring that up. I uh, rather enjoyed watching the staff's mock meeting the other day. I thought that was quite a bit of fun. And I'd recommend it if you know any of you have a good 15 minutes or so. There's some fun, fun parts to that. All right, any other comments? Lori, oh no, no. Were you gonna say something, Laura? Yeah, my comment doesn't have to do with the meetings, but I also wanted to let you know that your June 21st regular meeting, that's the third Tuesday of the month, uh, is it follows the Juneteenth holiday, which is June 20th. And so the city council has swung their meeting to the 21st. So we cannot hold a planning commission meeting that evening. And that is another <laughs> issue that we are strategizing about. So we will probably on June 7th be talking with you about alternative uh, meeting dates. Well, let's help you a little bit. <laughs> First of all, um, for those of us who are here tonight, um, with regard to after the 21st, are there any um, after the 21st is not good for me at all, um, but I can do it by Zoom, but I can't do it in person. So, um, and um, that's, which brings up another point that I was going to do, but I would like to hear anybody else with comments about problems with their schedule. Everyone's looking at their phones like I did. Derek? I think I'm okay. I'm 22nd, 23rd. I, I think I'm clear. Okay. I'm good. All right. Which, yes, yeah, go ahead, Tracy. It, it, unless you were going to stick with the same topic because I have a, a slightly different. No, I was going to go back to the whole, um, the topic of the Zooms and the and conference calls. That's where I'm going as well. So we'll, go, we'll, go, go, we'll go together. You go first. Tracy. Okay. I'm just um, thinking ahead to being in person. And I, I can't imagine that uh, one wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed to wear a mask, but I am wondering what, what that would be like for the public, especially people who are calling in and, you know, watching on video, like it, are there, is there anything that, uh, I need some, I need some direction on that because I would like to be able to wear a mask, but I'm also conscious of the fact that there might be some issues with that. I'm with her too on that concern. We don't have an answer. <laughs> but we, we certainly will ask the question. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just more and more. I know more and more people now who are like close associates have COVID, and it just feels like it's not. I don't feel comfortable being unmasked indoors with people. Now the other on that sort of topic is you know there. The council, other councils, and I would think that this would go to folks like we're uh, planning in the planning commission too, when somebody is unable to be actually present in the room, there's um, rules set up for teleconferencing uh, and or Zooming now is the new thing. Uh, why could not, why could we not do that in certain circumstances for individuals for whatever reason? Um, I believe that there are in your planning commission rules, there are something in there about occasionally being able to phone in. 
um, to a meeting. Again, I think it gets down to the technology pieces, how to work that out if everybody's phoning in. Um, and it's just the logistics of doing it. I, I am not the technical person to address these questions, which is why we have the folks who are working on this. So I think we're, we're struggling with the question of trying to figure out the technology to be as flexible as possible. And that's what the hybrid situation would mean. But again, as the next planning commission meeting is coming up soon, I think that's why we're, we're trying to say that, you know, perhaps a fallback position would be a fall in person um, if we can't figure out the logistics, but we are working very hard to figure out those logistics to give that flexibility. Well, not, not, to, not to say I'm pointing any fingers, but I know a lot of families that have done some very complex uh, multiple Zoom situations with multiple rooms in Zoom and all kinds of things. So I, I trust that our tech people can figure this out if families can figure it out. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's just the Zoom environment. You can see that we figured out Zoom. We've had meetings with breakout rooms. It's a question of you're now operating the uh, the in-person system has to be operated at the same time. So the technology oh. about running the meeting at City Hall and all that that entails needs to be integrated somehow with the online platform. So again, it's, it's, it's a technology piece that, uh, that we're, we're working on and, uh, and, and Rita's being part of that conversation to understand how this will work and be hopefully be ready to go for the next planning commission meeting. So one question that the city clerk had asked was whether there were, uh, whether the commission commissioners preferred to meet in person or remotely. That was a question that I was asked and I, my answer was we've never asked the question, but this is an opportunity if you have a perspective uh, to voice that. I mean, it would help me. <laughs> Mike, you had your hand up first. Yes, uh, my all, all things being equal, I would prefer to have us all in person, but things are not equal. Uh, as Tracy showed out, we're, despite what someone in Olympia or DC may think, there's still contagion out there. So uh, I'm concerned about that. Uh, I have experienced myself in another, hat that I wear, uh, where they've tried to do uh, meetings in a boardroom where some of the people are live and some of the people are in the room and some of the people are like we are right now on Zoom. And it's very disruptive. Um, what you have to do is you have to set up a camera in that conference room. And that it's very hard to try and carry on conversations and keep a continuity there. So maybe the technical people could come up with something where essentially you've got people sitting in a conference room with a workstation in front of them. So it's just like they were on, they will be on Zoom. They'll just be all together in a room on Zoom, which seems rather pointless to me. Um, so I, I would hope that we would be able to be in a situation at some point where we could all be in a room together because I think the communication uh, is much better in person. But I don't feel myself confident that, that we're there yet, particularly if we're in a, a, a larger public setting. We could work out something, I think, where, uh, you know, the seven or, or so or eight or nine of us could be spaced out enough in a large enough room like the conference room uh, at City Hall where we could feel safe. But we have to have, have uh, access for the public. And at that point, uh, you're opening the world to a whole different situation. So. I'll stop talking there and that's that would be my preference until I think we were 100% among ourselves confident that uh, the contagion was, was something that could be handled. Uh, in person really is not my preference. If we could work out a technical way, if people wanted to be in a conference room while the rest of us were on Zoom, fine. But as I say, my experience with that is, is not been a good one. Nathan? <laughs> Uh, uh, watching the, the hybrid mock meeting, 
that does give me some hope. It seemed fairly smooth from what I saw, and I think that we can only progress from there. Um, in terms of answering Lori's question, um, you know, I think it's great if we can aim for in person, but I, I would like to have some the opportunity or the option of hybrid just in case as a backup we have done uh, we've we have had meetings in the past Dwight where we have had commissioners who are gone call in and we have had their phone call there as we discuss in the council chambers and so I think having a system like that uh, through zoom just in case in the in, you know as backup just in case somebody can't make it or a couple of people can't come in either because of illness or other reasons, I think having that would allow them to participate. Um, and so I think there's some benefit to at least figuring that hybrid form out and putting that in our back pocket for when we need it later. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think I'm with Mike here and I think it's great to aim for in-person. Uh, I mean, getting back to, to where we used to be, so yeah. Go ahead, Mario. No, I, I want to echo a lot of the comments up here that have been, have been expressed here. Um, I would really love to be able to meet with you all in person. I've only been with you virtually. Um, but I think very much like Tracy, I mean, we are still at a point where no matter how much you want it to be over, it's not, this pandemic isn't, it's not done with us. Um, if you look at the data, um, and again, this is the other hat I wear, right? I just looked at the data before this meeting of where we are with cases in the county, and there are some increases, right? Um, and so, um, not just in, in case rate, but also in hospitalizations. And I think that's so. I just, I, I, I do want to be in person. Hybrid is always an issue. Um, I know that our IT folks are are working really hard just to 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 figure it out. But any hybrid situation I've ever been in. It's just not been really functional, right? Um, and you know, I just, you know, how can we function if we're in person? Um, I personally would be wanting to wear a mask. How would we be understandable to the public, right? How, you know, just a lot of just a lot of considerations. Would we have to be doing testing um, of ourselves every week, or you know, when we do meet? Um, I just. I just have a lot more questions and uh, just concerns as well. Tracy? I think I pretty much said as much with my question, but my still feeling very COVID cautious. My preference would be, unless I could wear a mask in person and I, and, and I knew what the conditions were exactly, which we don't, I would prefer to stick with all of us being together in this online platform um for now and with 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 yes wanting ultimately to be able to be with you physically in the physical world because there is something about that that i am missing but i don't want to catch COVID. for the record i'm on my 10th day today so if if i had covid which i do i would not have been able to attend the meeting so at least not till tomorrow, but some of you wouldn't want to be around me anyway, but that's up to you. I, I'm just sticking by the rules. So <clears throat> Nathan, did you have your hand up there? Uh, yes, really briefly. Um, I, it sounds like there's uh, quite a number of commissioners who are hesitant in the capabilities of the hybrid format, but I'm curious, were there any staff present here tonight who were able to attend the hybrid, hybrid mock meeting and can they speak to how smoothly that may have run and any issues they encountered? Um, I was there. I was actually the clerk for that meeting. <laughs> and um, it's sorry, it it was definitely uh, it, it ran smooth. I mean, Nathan, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you watched it and you felt that it, it ran pretty smoothly, but it's something that our city clerk has worked really hard on and, and we feel confident that we're going to be able to pull it off. We have another mock meeting this Friday. Um, either way, we still have to offer that in-person component. So I will be at City Hall, um, <laughs> whether you are there or not. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's 
I, I feel like we are going to be ready. The, the pieces are there, the technology's there. We had staff on site and off site. We had on site and off site presenters, um, uh, on site and off site commenters. And, and I feel like it went really smoothly. The hard piece is sadly on the clerks <laughs> where you're managing two different uh, systems where it's going to take two of us now to manage the um, in-person meetings and then another person to handle the uh, Zoom portion of the meeting. So th that's that's where we are, are working hard at. So, but yeah, I, I felt like it, it also went really smoothly. There wasn't any sound issues. Um, I think one per only one person wasn't able to hear some of the comments, but it was just the one person, so. And, and if I remember correctly, the, the time delay between comments from in person to Zoom to back to in person was, you know, half a second or something like that. It right. It was yeah. really rapid. There yeah, wasn't Chief huge Moen, delays. Yeah, Chief mm -hmm. Moen was giving a presentation, was able to speak to that. The delay was just a second, if anything. So. And, and he was able to broadcast and share his screen in the presentation. I really liked his presentation. Um, and I, I've, from what I saw, it looked very well put together, very well organized, and it seemed to run very smoothly without much issue. So I'm confident in, in, in that ability, but I'm curious to hear what others think. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I, I have some confidence as well, uh, Nathan, that the technical piece of this can be worked out where i've seen the uh the problem be in the weak link is is in the wetware not the hardware and trying to run essentially two separate meetings uh at the same time to be aware of what's happening uh in basically two separate locations uh, one which is maybe online and one which is physically in the room is where i've seen this fall apart um so i i, I am concerned about that dwight <laughs> i think that that's what i would counsel you to be thinking about is it's hard enough to manage a meeting with nine squares on a page. If you've got nine squares on a page and then you've got nine folks sitting in a room somewhere else and where, how do you manage that, uh, that type of bifurcated meeting is where I've seen this fall apart. So look forward to seeing the technical guys and what they can come up with. Well, wow. but I think it, 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 it's a whole different world. It, it's really not the same thing as uh, it's just bringing this together. And it's not really necessarily even a technical issue. It, it, it's going to be how do you change the way you manage a meeting and also the way you participate in the meeting as an individual. It's going to be different because you're going to have people who are sitting in a room by themselves or not necessarily, but in a room. And then you've got your people online. And those are actually two different locations, no matter how well you get mold them together technically. It's gonna feel different. It's gonna be two different pieces that have to be managed simultaneously by one person. Or we all kind of have to watch out for each other. I've seen that. I think we'll too. be watching out for each other. Yeah, and I've seen that go off the rails real fast. <laughs> so anyway, I'll just stop there. So I'm curious to see if this could work. Um, I think as an occasional, you know, rather than doing a phone in, being able to on an emergency situation, if the Sammamish Bridge goes down, uh, you know, <laughs> and so half of us are living on an island, uh, you know, it gives you an option. Uh, but uh, as a regular basis, I'm not, I'm not sure that's going to work. Well, sometimes we're all accused of, of living on an island, but that's a more of a political statement. Different story. Right. So one of the, have you folks ever tried, um, this is to staff, what would happen if, you know, the, the um, city hall has a Wi-Fi, right? Right? So what would happen if I brought my computer and sat it in front of me and all of us had our computers sitting in front of us, our laptops, and we sign on to Wi-Fi and we had our little squares, then the other people can, we're still there and we're, we're, sort of talking in the same uh you know group and then then the um the individuals can talk to us and provide testimony and still hear us on online i kind of share tracy's and mario's concern with regard to uh what our exposure is if we are out into the open 
I have less concerns if it's the eight or nine of us sitting at our computers in the same room, you know, um, that we're, st we're still virtual, but we're sort of not. But I, I think our public has got to be able to s speak to us. And I'm not sure if we're all ready to have um, uh, co congregations in the city chambers. I, I just not, I, I'm still a little nervous about that myself. Mike? I agree with you, Dwight. I'm not sure we're in a situation where that's right. But the other thing is, I think one of the things we've learned is I think Zoom is a great resource for community input. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a it is a difficult. There are barriers to people coming physically to congregate in one place at City Hall. Being able to zoom in, I think, vastly increases the participation ease and, and the amount of participation. So I'd be eager to keep that in place for public comment, regardless of what we decided about what we did among ourselves. I agree, and there's still 11 people attendees listening to us and they're probably pulling their hairs out and saying when are we going when are you guys going to be done Mariel, <laughs> your turn <laughs> thank you um, i think that one other question um and uh, debbie or gloria um, maybe you guys i don't know if you have the answer i'm just wondering with the changes themselves what type of adaptations have been done with regards to air filtration um, in order to, to be able to improve the content. Because I know that's another, that's another um, mitigating um, strategy, right? To, to, to do such, you know, but. I don't, I, I don't know the answer. Again, we, unfortunately, we're not the ones working on this particular project. Uh, Rita has been working on the hybrid portion of it, but I, I don't have the answer. Uh, we'll certainly have to develop an answer and have an answer before June 7th, but it, you know, this was recent news and now everybody's scrambling to figure out how to make it work. So we'll do the best and let you know where we end up. Well, but it I helps me to know what have you all are picture, don't we? Pardon me? Someday we all have to have a picture of the new planning commission. Right. <laughs> So I think it would be good if we were all in mask just to do it for, we can have two, a maskless and a mask. So just to save it for, for the future there. Um, okay, well, it sounds like we have uh, beaten this to a, a, a little bit of a mush. So our staff can wrap it up in uh, parchment paper and throw it back at the council. But I'm sure they must be struggling a bit too because they have a whole different set of uh, legal requirements that is even beyond what, what we have. And so that's, that's up to them, so. Uh, I think they're planning to have the council retreat in person at City Hall on June 3rd and 4th. They're going to have their hot dogs and eat them too. That's okay. so. Is there anything else good for the order? So I would invite any of you that would like to give me feedback with regard to how I manage the public hearing to please give me a call, and I would appreciate your pointers and your uh, the good, the pluses and the minuses because. Um, it's, I was just talking to my wife and it's been uh, almost 10 years since I managed a public hearing like this and I've never done one on Zoom. And so I really appreciate Rita and Lori and Debbie's support and all the documents and putting eight attachments together. I, I feel sorry for those folks. Um, and I, it's bad enough for us, but for other people, people, it would be very difficult. So uh, please feel free to give me a call. I'd, I'd appreciate it a lot. Um, so <clears throat> just for the record, Lori, when are we going to really vote on this stuff? Well, ideally on June 7th. Uh, that all, is the, all goal. The, the whole list that we just did. Right. Okay. Right. 
Could I suggest one thing? Since you can, you you have that all in a Word document, right? Mm -hmm. Could you read, just take that and put line numbers along the side um, and then have that um, for, well, you can put it out on the web, I don't care, but it's a lot easier for us to, if we want to do an amendment to go by page and line number, it's um, faster and it's clearer. And for the purpose of, God forbid, any more amendments, but it'd be easier, I think, actually for you and Debbie, so that we're not thumbing through a bunch of pages, not sure exactly who um, Commissioner I will a and Commissioner B is. work with Rita to make that happen as best as I can. Okay, thank you. Is there any problem with that, oh, Mario? No, not a problem. That's actually a great idea. Thank you so much, Dwight, for suggesting that. Um, what I wanted to say is I wanted to thank you, Lori, Debbie, and Rita for all you've done, but also for, um, I wanted to thank the interpreters as well, and for trying, you know, working hard to increase accessibility to our meetings for our community. Um, it's really important, I think, for all of us, and I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Mario. All right. <clears throat> hearing uh, if there's no, oh, Tracy. I, I, given that we have been getting a lot of community feedback um, about the comprehensive plan in Missing Middle, even before the public hearing, and now we've had that public hearing, what, what's the procedure for incorporating that into our for thinking, future thinking, further thinking, um, and having that reflected in a vote that would happen on June 7th? So well, well, go ahead, Lori. I was going to say we will do a summary of the comments that were received, and then you can think about those comments and see if they, those prompt you to suggest any changes. I can say that one comment that we heard several uh, speakers address was the toll pipeline. That's not something that's in this particular package of amendments. It, it is likely to come up. I think with the transportation element, um, I think that that project is looking at trails and that kind of thing. So I, again, I, some some of the comments would be deferred to other places, um, but we'll try to do a summary and then you can consider that and and as a group decide if you want to make changes based on those comments. Okay, great. Thank you so much. If I may suggest from a um, <clears throat> organizational standpoint, so um, Debbie's going to provide us another packet. And if she provides us with any amendments that we have not already approved, I would ask that she um, highlight them in mm -hmm. yellow. And then um, I would ask that each commissioner look through their packet and then what I would um, ask for are uh, each commissioner to identify those pages and line numbers which they wish to discuss for amendments. And you can do the, you know, that way we take pieces out and we discuss those pieces and the rest of the document will be uh, with the understanding, and we'll, I'll have a motion for this, <clears throat> we'll, we'll stand, um, and then all we're going to do is do these po portions that each of you have pulled out, and we'll vote on those portions if necessary, and then put them back with the rest. And that way, we're not doing the whole document. We're only going to do the document which you guys whole pieces to reconsider, shall we say. All right. And I might say that the only new language that you'll see will be this new language about the landscape strip in the missing middle housing regulations. I probably will not uh, highlight that in yellow because we have so much yellow highlighting between existing and proposed text, but I'll choose another highlight color for that. 
between the which text and the what text. It just, so the, I, the way we do our underline strike through is to highlight all changes in yellow. So I don't want to, I, I okay. need to somehow distinguish this more recent change. So I will highlight it in blue or green or some other color. Uh, and again, there's only one at this point. Okay, so just, I guess I was a little out of it here. So whether it's a strike through or uh, an addition or amendment, <clears throat> it's going to be highlighted yellow. That's different from what's existing in the code today, correct? Okay, thank you for, okay, Derek. Comically, I just wanna point out that Kenmore does have a proclamation identifying two different colors of yellow that we could use for highlighting updates. <laughs> just... Of course we do. <laughs> Well, can we have two different shades of blue, too, and green? <laughs> You're making my head hurt, you know? At the end of COVID, my, I'm starting to get a headache. You know, I'm going to have to, you know, do something for that in a few yeah. minutes. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's not going to be beer. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, now, is there any further comments? Uh, oh, Nathan. The other side of my screen. I'm gonna keep this very brief. Thank you to all the hard work of our city staff, Lori, Debbie, Rita, and the interpreters as well. I re really appreciate all of your hard work and what you've done to help set this up to make this public hearing a success. So again, as always, thank you so much. It, it never goes beyond me. I promise every meeting, I'm always thankful to have you guys around and all your hard work. And same with my fellow commissioners here tonight. I know it's not easy giving up two and a half hours now of your Tuesday evenings. So it's always a pleasure to be around you guys. So thank you so much for your dedication as well. So we, oh, Mike, go ahead. I'll just leap onto the fray here and I'll be short. I wanna also add my appreciation and compliments to both Debbie and Lori. Uh, throughout this and throughout all the years, I've never seen you folks be anything but perfectly neutral and, and really perfect in what I've come to see as a, a standard for what staff is supposed to be. I've never felt like you tried to bias us or, or railroad us in any way. I thought your presentations have been fair, thorough, complete, and you've always been very good at answering, especially my very troublesome questions at times. And I've seen no limit to that, uh, to both of your response and your patience. So thank you. Thank you again. I, I ditto that comment that's that's really wonderful i think that it, it, you guys have done a, a great job regardless of what other folks have may have tried to malang you but i think that you've been very fair and honest with us so that's that we all all of us have different viewpoints and that's why the the council put us on this commission is to have different viewpoints and so that's just great um, so now, if there's no objection, the meeting of the planning commission for, um, if I can look it up today is, um, the 17th of May is hereby adjourned. Good evening, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank, Good night. You. Thank you. Everyone. Good night, everybody. Who better do it? Good night. Hey, oh, never mind.